Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. From NJPBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Brianna Venozzi. Tonight, a special edition of NJ Spotlight News looking at a recent investigation into rampant forced labor and human rights abuses in the Chinese fishing industry, how that taints much of the fish imported around the country, and ultimately what lands on your dinner plate here in New Jersey. The reporting was done by the Outlaw Ocean Project and focused on the Chinese squid fishing fleet following the vessels and their crews around the world's oceans. We'll speak with Ian Urbina, who led the multi-year reporting project shortly. But first, here's a look at how one fish in particular, the squid, became such a popular product here in the U.S. <music> For millennia, from Japan to Portugal, people have eaten squid. But Americans arrive late to the feast. Up until the early 1980s, most Americans viewed squid as fish bait, a slimy, unappetizing sea creature unfit for human consumption. But in just a few years, the popularity of squid exploded in the U.S. It went from relative obscurity served mostly in niche restaurants, predominantly in cities along the American East and West Coast, to just three years later, becoming a wildly popular appetizer on the menus of hundreds of chain restaurants across the entire country. This was a rapid transformation, and it offers several important stories. What took place in the minds and tastes of the American consumer is a wondrous tale about the magic of marketing. Behind that, there's a parable about a conservation campaign gone awry and the perils of mass-produced food. And along the way, we also get a broader history lesson about China's emergence as the global superpower of seafood, operating the largest fishing fleet the world has ever known. By the 1970s, U.S. fish stocks were on the verge of collapse. Overfishing had wiped out most of the fish near shore, raising the alarm for conservationists and the U.S. government. While stocks of traditionally targeted fish, like cod, menhaden, tuna, and swordfish, had plummeted, squid remained abundant because most Americans had not developed a taste for it. Alarmed by the looming crisis, Congress, universities, and conservationists began a rebranding campaign the likes of which never seen before or since. Its goal? To convince Americans to eat this slimy creature. The federal government paid universities to figure out how to persuade fishermen, chefs, and American restaurant patrons that squid was delicious. MIT published a report calling on restaurants and grocery stores to stop calling it squid and instead use its more exotic name, calamari. Bread it, deep fry it like onion rings, and American consumers will gobble it up, the report concluded. They couldn't have been more correct. One hurdle standing in the way of squid going mainstream in the U.S. was the time, difficulty, dirtiness, and cost of cleaning squid. In 1981, two engineering professors from the University of California, Davis, Paul Singh and colleague Daniel E. Brown, developed and patented the first automated squid cleaning machine. They were convinced that by automating this process, the cost of squid would go down and demand would go up. But the machine failed to sell in the U.S. for two reasons, one small and one big. The small one was bad timing. That year, El Nino decimated squid landings off the California coast. The bigger factor, however, was China. 
cheap labor and lax regulations on workers' rights and environmental protections transformed China into the world's sweatshop. The U.S. reliance on China to do this dirty job has only increased since then. Most of the squid eaten by Americans is imported from China. And most of that squid is fished from the high seas off both coasts of South America. It's then packed into refrigeration vessels called reefers and sent to China for processing. Even squid that's caught just off the coast of California is sent on a 12,000 mile round trip to processing plants in China before being sent back across the Pacific to U.S. consumers. As our oceans and marine life continue to be threatened by the climate crisis, squid are uniquely resistant to these threats. Ocean acidification, which is fast destroying many of the world's coral reefs, is meanwhile having limited effect on squid. Rising ocean temperatures from global warming are not killing off squid, but causing it to reproduce faster. Whereas most other fish stocks globally are crashing, squid numbers are going up largely because overfishing has removed most squid predators like sharks, tuna, and whales. Compared to other animal protein sources, squid has a smaller carbon footprint, making it even more appealing to environmentally-minded chefs and climate-conscious foodies. For these reasons, many experts point to squid as being a food for the future. But at what cost? Fishing is ranked as the deadliest job in the world, and by many measures, Chinese squid ships are widely viewed as the most brutal. They are ranked as the largest purveyor of illegal fishing in the world. Debt bondage, human trafficking, violence, preventable injuries, and death are common in this fleet. U.S. and U.N. officials say that China's squid ships are more than any other type the most prone to using forced labor. As the popularity of calamari grows, what toll will it have on the planet and to the people who do the work? And joining me now is Ian Urbina. He's the director for the Outlaw Ocean Project. Ian, welcome back to the show. Uh, much of your reporting focuses on the fact that China is this global, uh, has a global dominance on the fishing industry, but it really relies on forced labor, uh, other human rights ab abuses. Why are Chinese fishing fleets most prone to this? Well, I think. Um the Chinese are most prone because number one, China is generally an opaque place. And so um, it's very difficult for outsiders to find out what's going on on land and even more so on their vessels because they're not as willing to answer questions as maybe other countries are. Um, I also think it's a, it's a country that has scaled everything up so hugely uh, and in so doing, it has cut a lot of corners when it comes to human rights and environmental concerns that we might have so as to become the sort of market superpower. Mm, so a real lack of oversight. How are these workers ending up on these boats and how common is forced labor in Chinese fleets? So Chinese distant water fishing vessels, those vessels that are on the high seas or in foreign waters tend to be the most brutal. Um, before COVID, most of the Chinese vessels were using foreign crew. So you might have a fishing ship that had 40 males on it and five of them would be Chinese officers and the rest would be typically Indonesian, African or Filipino crew. A lot of those guys are trafficked. Um, they don't speak the language of their captain. Um, they've flown across the world to get the job they have their passport confiscated and they're signing a two-year contract when they have to stay on the ship. Given any type of guidance, Ian, to even follow that contract, I'm guessing it's not in their native language. Uh, is there any assistance for these workers? 
No, I mean, these jobs are so sought after and those who are getting them are, tend to be rural, sometimes illiterate, often never having left their village, much less their country. So they're easily bamboozled, you know, and for sure, they're not really having advice of counsel as they sign these contracts. They're just sort of signing papers that they don't know what they say and then getting on board the ships. Your work highlighted how the U.S. is really driving demand in this industry. And I'm curious as to whether that makes it even more difficult for the workers to get out of these situations. Is it even possible for them to get out? Yeah, I mean, historically, when workers have um, sought to leave the ships, um, They've either asked the captain and in rare cases been allowed off the ship before their contract is over, or they've jumped ship uh, when they come near port and attempted to escape that way. That usually doesn't go too well because they're in a foreign country and they have no way of getting help to get back to their home country. They don't speak the language. Or they stage mutinies and strikes, which draw attention sometimes of press in foreign countries. These are often the ways that these crews escape. Uh this next documentary we're going to share, Ian, really looks at the plight of one man's death aboard one of these ships. Can you take me inside your reporting and set it up for me? Yeah, I mean, this was a young man named Fadil. Uh, he was on a ship called the Wei U-18. In many ways, it's a sort of textbook uh, Chinese squid vessel, uh, traverses the globe, you know, stays at sea for sometimes two, three years. A mother ship comes and picks up their catch and brings it back to China, but the crew stay on board. They're cut off from family. Um, they can't communicate. They stay on the water the whole time. Violence is endemic. They make very, very little. You know, we're talking hundreds of dollars per month during the time they're there with huge deductions. Um, it's, you know, 16, 18 hour days, six days a week, rain or shine, sick or healthy. Uh, it's a really sort of Dickensian type of workplace. All right, let's take a look. In July of 2018, a young man named Fadil left his home in Indonesia to work as a deckhand on a high seas fishing vessel, a Chinese squid jigger called the Weiyu 18. He was 25 years old, venturing out to sea for the first time. Fadil boarded the Weiyu 18 at the port of Busan, South Korea where he joined a crew of nine other Indonesians and 20 Chinese. From Busan, the rusty red and white steel-hulled ship traveled for several weeks to South America to work the high seas fishing grounds off the coasts of Peru and Chile. Working in 12 to 24 hour shifts, the men typically slept during the day and worked at night since squid fishing requires using extremely bright light bulbs to lure the animals towards the surface. On the ship, the men slept four to a room in wooden bunk beds, each with one blanket on a soggy foam mattress made wet by walls that sweated with condensation. The Indonesian crew was provided drinking water that was rust-colored and tasted like metal, while their Chinese counterparts drank bottled water. Indonesian deckhands were only given salt water for bathing and washing their clothes, and for rations they were given rice and instant noodles. Violence on board the Weiyu 18 was common. The men described the foreman and the captain hitting them on the head and slapping and kicking them, usually for not understanding instructions given in Chinese. 
taking too long to untangle a fishing line or dropping squid on the deck. By August of 2019, after being at sea for over a year, the Wei U-18 was gripped by an outbreak of beriberi, a debilitating and painful form of malnutrition caused by a lack of vitamin B1, also known as thiamine. Symptoms include full body swelling, intense fatigue, and if left untreated, death. Experts say that allowing workers on fishing ships to contract and die from beriberi constitutes criminal neglect because the disease is so easily prevented through proper nutrition or vitamin pills and can be treated when it occurs. As over a third of the world's fish stocks have collapsed or are on the verge, fishing fleets have begun traveling further and staying at sea longer in hopes of catching the minimum needed to remain profitable. This is especially true of Chinese squid ships that typically travel further than other vessels and stay at sea for up to two years. Chinese captains rely heavily on transshipment where catch is offloaded to refrigeration vessels at sea, allowing boats to remain in the fishing grounds indefinitely. This practice greatly increases the risk of beriberi among long-range fishing vessels. Too weak to work, Fadil stayed in his quarters while the other Indonesian deckhands took turns checking on him. He became too tired to sit up, and he vomited any food or water he consumed. For treatment aboard the Wei U-18, Fadil was given the Chinese equivalent of ibuprofen, in packaging indicating that the medication had expired. The captain said Fadil could not go home because he was on a two-year contract with the manning agency that had recruited him. But the truth was that Fadil's contract was only for 12 months, a term he had completed just before falling ill. For the next two weeks, Fadil's condition quickly deteriorated. He had trouble breathing, and he could not stand or urinate. Then came the seizures. The other Indonesian deckhands decided to move Fadil into Ramadan's room, who was doing all he could to comfort his dying friend. Neola. 
several days after Fadil died, the captain ordered that his body be buried at sea, claiming to have received permission from Fadil's family back in Indonesia. The captain ordered the men to build a wooden coffin for Fadil's body. They filled the casket with metal weights and wrapped it in anchor chain to ensure it would sink. Fadil's body was then buried at sea. Fishing is the most dangerous profession on the planet. Each year, over 100,000 workers, like Fadil, die on the job. What remains unclear is how many of those deaths are from forced labor or neglect. Fadil's story is just one example of the larger problem of captivity on distant water fishing ships and of a disease that should have been eradicated a century ago. Ian, it's really a harrowing journey for these workers and, and watching Fadil's story there is, it's dark and disturbing to say the least. Is anything being done to end these abuses? The abuses vary, right? So you've got debt bondage and wage theft, you have violence on crew, you have captive crew, you have crew that are not allowed to leave when they get sick or injured, all different types of abuses and different efforts are being made based on the different types of abuses. Not enough is being done. And if things are going to be done, it's probably going to most effectively be done by the companies themselves, governments applying pressure on the companies that benefit from these practices and sell the seafood. Um, but things are starting. In the last couple of months especially, you've seen a lot more congressional figures, including from New Jersey, um, apply pressure on companies to clean up their act. And that was Representative Chris Smith, who you mentioned there. But aside from probing and holding hearings, what else can the American government be doing? Well, I mean, there, there are a couple of things. One, there are laws on the books that allow Customs and Border Patrol to stop the import of things that are tied to forced labor. And so um, one clear tool on the table would be to apply that to these types of imports, seafood coming from China in general, or seafood coming from that province in particular, or specific companies. Um, there are other things. There are sanctions called Global Magnitsky, which can put essentially individuals or companies on a treasury blacklist, and that freezes assets. Um, uh, and then lastly, you know, there are, uh, NOAA has the ability to put certain types of seafood on a special list that requires any import of that seafood to produce more paperwork that shows where it came from and what the conditions were and behavior was. And so adding more names to that list would also be a step in the right direction, most likely. And, and is there anything that you can do as a consumer or even as I'm thinking, you know, a local mom and pop shop and eatery here in New Jersey? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're all multiple things, right? So we buy seafood at the grocery store or at the restaurant, we can ask questions in both of those places. Is this seafood local? You know, what's the company? Have you ever looked to see if it's processed or caught in China, et cetera? Asking smart, pushy questions about um, what you eat. 
Um, looking online, there are organizations that rank better and worse players and checking that information out as well. Stepping back from seafood in general um, is some option that some folks have chosen. Um, these are all things that you can do um, to sort of help correct the problem. Yeah, the power of purchasing and, and what you purchase. Ian Urbina, thanks so much for sharing these uh, really important stories and documentaries with us. Thanks for having me. That's going to do it for us tonight, but you can find more of Ian's reporting online at the Outlaw Ocean Project. I'm Brianna Venozzi. For the entire NJ Spotlight News team, thanks for being with us. We wish you a happy new year. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and by the PSCG Foundation. Our future relies on more than clean energy. Our future relies on empowered communities, the health and safety of our families and neighbors, of our schools and streets. The PSEG Foundation is committed to sustainability, equity, and economic empowerment. Investing in parks, helping towns go green, supporting civic centers, scholarships, and workforce development that strengthen our community.